All right. Uh, we are going to continue in our series, but before we do, um, as we talk about just this um, idea of being battle ready, I want to reemphasize again this fact that we don't do this alone. We do this together as a church. And uh, this, uh, well, for a number of months, we've a mon- number of months ago, um, and over the last few months, we've been emphasizing just the importance of membership and and as a local church coming together and knowing that we're on the same page, we're fighting the fight together. And so um, last night I had the opportunity to visit with the Tanner Hackle family and uh, spend some time uh, just visiting about the church and where, we're, where we each are at uh, theologically. And uh, uh, they had made this expression just to say, we want to be part of the church body here on the same page, uh, doing battle together. And so they're down here in front. <laughs> you can... You can say hello to them. Brigham, that wasn't completely awkward, was it? <laughs> it was a, that's, a, that's a funny story. If you want to know the story behind that, I'll let you know. But uh, now, as we uh, just continue to think about doing battle together, um, there's uh, all around us it feels like the world is upside down, doesn't it? Uh, this last week, I watched a... Uh, <laughs> I haven't actually watched... And news. I haven't read a lot, but um, I did actually see a clip of an individual coming up to a patrol car and just opening fire on unsuspecting patrolmen inside. And then I watched as the crowd just did nothing and then blocked um, ambulances and things. It, It just seemed very, very heartbreaking to me. Yeah, I mean, it was just that it's it's like you're watching and you're like what what is happening and that's just one story of many that we're witnessing now um what that does is highlight that we are actually in a battle uh and it is a very serious battle and i think for a long time in america we've had the freedoms of just kind of living in a, somewhat of a utopia almost unaware and and yet at the same time uh, history, even in America, has seen some dark days. Uh, and it doesn't take much to go back into history and look at other countries and see some very dark times. And it doesn't take long to go into ancient history and, some, and see just continued acts of violence and senseless uh, acts that just, again, make us realize that there is evil all around us and there is a battle at place, uh, taking place. And, and yet, just so that we don't only see the evil, I want you also to know that for as many stories as we see highlighted of all the evil that is going on, I know and I trust that God is moving and working, and there are some great stories that we're just not hearing about. They're not being highlighted. People who are coming to faith, who are people who are sharing not just the word, but actual food and water with those who are hungry and those who are thirsty. And there's actually uh, somebody standing alongside a single mother or a, or a battered wife and, 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 and doing ministry, speaking hope and the words of the gospel. And there are actually people out there rescuing children from human trafficking. And, and there's, there's a lot of good things happening. And as a church, we get to play a part. We have been called to play a part, to enter into the battle, to not stand back and just say, wow, this is what's happening, and then, and then just watch, but to enter into the battle. And so that's what we've been talking about for the last number of weeks. And I, I don't think that, uh, that we would kid ourselves in, in stating after the last number of weeks that there isn't a battle, but we've been talking all about that. And so in week one, we talked specifically about, well, if there's a battle, there has to be an enemy. And uh, we looked at 1 Peter chapter 5, uh, verse 8, where it talks very specifically about our enemy. He is our adversary. He is very real. He is not our friend. He is our enemy. And then uh, because we have an enemy, well, there is a battle. It's not just some figment of our imagination. It's not made up. It is, it is real. And the enemy's desire is to create division and destruction, fights. As we looked at verse 9, as he schemes of 1 Peter chapter 5. But we began looking at Ephesians chapter uh, 6 to speak of the defenses that God has given us. And to, again, remind us that we are to clothe ourselves as soldiers 
for battle. And so we looked at Ephesians chapter 6, uh, 10, and, and following there. And so we see the words, be strong in the Lord, now, in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And um, so very specifically then, in the following verses, he looked at uh, the pieces of armor that he gives us. And I'm going to just go through these quickly. The belt of truth, fixed right off the middle section here, it holds, holds everything together. Uh, Ephesians four, uh, 6, verse 14, Stand therefore, having fastened the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And if you want to go into all those in detail, they're on our YouTube uh, channel, on our website. You can go through and listen to all of those. Um, so the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. And then in the uh, next week, we looked at the shoes to carry the gospel of peace and the shield of faith in verses uh, 15 and 16 of chapter 6, where it says, and sh as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, in all circumstances take up the shield of faith which, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And so we talked just about how we as soldiers carry the gospel and we need to have firm footing and good shoes in order to have uh, traction, not just to stand our ground, but to take ground. And, and we have a shield, our faith, which protects us from the flaming arrows that the evil one continues to speak and try to shoot directly at our heart and our mind. And, and it's so important to be uh, putting on these pieces of armor, And then last week we looked at the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And verse 17, where it says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And uh, these are our uh, um, illustrations. And, and where most have stopped with this illustration, where many, many people continue to say, well, all the physical pieces of armor, they've all been... Uh, expressed here, what more is there? I think there is another weapon that uh, Roman soldiers didn't necessarily carry, per se, but a soldier of God must practice, must practice in order to stand firm, and it's this idea of prayer. This is the, the next verses that we see uh, presented. Now, I, I want to go back just a little bit. And bear with me as I do, because the groundwork that Paul is, these are the final words that Paul writes to the believers here in Ephesus. And we've been looking at chapter 6 very intentionally and, and slowly, uh, taking just a couple verses or just one verse each week. But there's been a lot that Paul has been writing to the believers there in Ephesus to try to encourage them uh, in what Paul knows to be difficult days ahead. And I think this is why it's such a great letter for us to study, because they're valuable words for us even today as we look to possibly even difficult days ahead. And so when Paul writes these letters, uh, he had a good foundation with this body of believers. He had spent some significant time, about three years with them before he had to leave the city. It was running out of town on a rail um, but he left the the soldier, or he left the church there with a good, solid foundation, and uh, he he wants to remind them in his letter. So in chapter one, if you if you just kind of read through all of these, in chapter one he emphasizes and reminds them that they are children of God, that they have been redeemed from a life of sin, that they have been purchased through Christ's sacrifice, they've been given the Holy Spirit, and through Christ. We have salvation. He reminds them of this, a point that we've talked about. And so in a, chapter 1, verse 7, it says, In him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. And then in chapter 2, uh, Paul reminds the believers there, both Gentiles and the Jews, where they were at at one time in their standing with God, which was enemies. And he says it was the grace through Christ that has been offered in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, he, he clearly makes that known when he says, For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. He's reminding them of this truth. And then in chapter 3, he challenges them and encourages them even more when he says in verse uh, 13 of chapter 3, he says, So I ask you, even in light of what's to come and what's, what's happening do not lose heart over what I am suffering for you, 
which is your glory, according, in verse 16, according to the riches of his glory, that he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in his inner being. Now, why is all of this important? Because if we're going to bring honor to God in our lives, as, it, as he states in chapter 4, verse 17, he says, Now I say this to testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as Gentiles do in the futility of their mind. But in verse 23, he continues, But to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. This is, this is what he's challenging them and calling them to. And, and he he recognizes that we don't accomplish this as a church. We don't accomplish this in a vacuum, but we, uh, we, we accomplish this in the context of community and an accountability, which is why he states in chapter 4, verse 11, that he, speaking of Christ, gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Wow. This is, he's not left us alone. He's brought us together to accomplish this, and he's given us people to help us in this walk and to encourage us, but he's not done yet. So in chapter 5, we see another great summary, and, and he challenges us to how we apply this in, in everyday life. And he says, look carefully then on how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Some of the very first words that I got to share here uh, when, when I began uh, here preaching. Uh, these verses right here. Paul is reminding them that no matter what they may face, they are to walk. Uh, not as unwise, but as wise. And so Paul would draw this illustration he would make important uh, illustrations uh, about the marriage and how, uh, as, <laughs> as we look at that marriage example, ultimately we see Christ in that because he uh, gave himself for the church. Uh, we see uh, teachings on parenting and, and what, how, how we as a child of God bring glory to God. Uh, he even has a word for slaves. Uh, and before getting into chapter 6 and really drilling down on, on some of these things that he's uh, encouraging us in. So if you've never had the chance to read through Ephesians, the book, man, there's so much valuable content there. And so then that leads us, as we studied through the, the main crux of the armor that God has given us, we come to these last verses that is um, part of, I believe, the armor of God. And it's required both in defensive and offensive weaponry in our battle against the evil one. And this is what he says in verse 18. And uh, following in verse 20, you can follow along with me uh, in your scriptures or uh, on the screen there. But he says this, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end. Keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Now, these are the last, uh, some of the last words that he speaks to the believers there in Ephesus is that he wants them to be praying for him, that he might be able to boldly proclaim the truths in the scripture, that he may be able to boldly proclaim the gospel, that he might be able to uh, speak into the days, hope, and life where there is darkness and there is destruction. But it starts... With prayer, this is his, his invitation. I haven't, I didn't see it this week, but um, I I, uh, I was reading through this and I had read some materials and and the word all came out as as I was reading uh, different commentaries and I and as I watched different uh, uh, even pastors and preachers talk about this passage, the word all really came out. And so I don't know if you've ever looked at this three letter word uh, with significance before, but in this, if you have a a highlighter or a pencil, you can, you can look at all the times that it says all. It says praying at all times with all prayer and supplication, with all perseverance, uh, and then uh, uh, also for me that my words may be given to proclaim the gospel. So all the saints. Now, that first part, pray at all Times. And I know you've probably talked about or thought, well, what does that mean? What does that, what does that look like? Pray at all times. Well, this, 
I think, focuses us to the importance of prayer and how our attitude of prayer really should be at all times. This, uh, it speaks to the frequency of our prayer, uh, how, we, how we pray. And so there's lots of verses that talk about prayer, but just a few quickly. In Luke chapter 21, verse 36, we see that uh, Jesus is, is there giving some instructions to his disciples. He says, but stay awake at all times. Praying that you have strength to escape all these things that, you're, that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of, Ma, of Man. Romans chapter 12, verse 12 says, Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be what? Constant in prayer. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 says, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. In Acts chapter 6, verse 4, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And if you're sitting there thinking, I'm not getting these all down, I will, I will happily share the scriptures with you. You can uh, just let me know and I'll, I'll send them to you. But this, this goes to speak of the consistency through the New Testament teachings of, of our attitude towards prayer and our frequency to prayer. And, and there's even this, this modeling that takes place within the New Testament scriptures. A man that we don't really know much about, his name is Cornelius. And he speaks, uh, people recognize him as a man of prayer. In Acts chapter 10, verse 2, it says, A devout man who feared God with all his household gave alms generously to the people and prayed continually to God. Jesus gives us countless examples of the importance for prayer by modeling it. When in Luke chapter 5 verse 16 we see the account where it says he would withdraw to a desolate place and he would pray. In Luke chapter 6 verse 12 it says in these days he went out to the mountain to pray and all night he continued to pray. He continued in prayer to God. And in Matthew chapter 9, verse 38, uh, he says, Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And so we see this modeled by people in the New Testament. This continual act of prayer. And so it makes sense that in preparation for the battles that we face in life, prayer should be an aspect of our lives that we take very seriously. Jesus modeled it, Paul's instructing it, and uh, we see his words again in, to the Thessalonians in uh, chapter 5, verse 17, pray without ceasing. So pray at all times. Now, what does this look like? Uh, especially this last week, I found uh, myself at times in here, uh, intentionally in prayer. I found myself driving down the highway, eyes open, of course, and, and I was... I was praying. The radio in my truck doesn't work. It gives me lots of time to think or pray. So it's good and silent. It's a great time to just spend some time in prayer at a table praying. But I found myself also uh, cleaning up the kitchen, washing dishes, doing tasks that I just know how to do without really thinking. And I found myself saying, while I'm doing this, I'm going to be praying. And, and God, through I believe his spirit, would just bring people to my mind, situations to my mind. And so I would just, I would pray these prayers while I'm, while I'm doing the things that I'm doing. And I think that's, I think God was trying to impress upon you better start practicing it if you're going to start preaching it. So uh, there's the encouragement uh, to just wherever you find yourself. Now, I would encourage you if you're operating heavy machinery or sharp knives or things like that, maybe some focus should be given to the, the equipment, um, but you might lose a finger or something. But uh, continually pray at all times. Now... Um, just a just a quick uh, quick question, kids, have you um, have you ever had to ask your parents for something that you want? Have you ever had to ask your parents for something that you want? Okay, hopefully that's true because everything that you get to do or that you want to accomplish, you ask permission for. Well, when um, when we think through this, um, and and siblings, it's okay if you start pointing fingers now. You got it? So it's okay. If you start pointing fingers at one another, have you, ever, um, have you ever blamed your brother or sister for just talking all the time? No? Maybe? Yes? Kind of? I mean, parents, have you, ever, have you ever just wanted to withdraw to a quiet place? <laughs> 
because it, it feels like there's just this constant conversation happening in the room, right? And while sometimes we might find that an aggravation, I think at the same time, it's like in the church. When we hear this rustle and bustle of, of noise, we have two responses to that. That of, oh man, I wish they'd just keep that kid quiet, right? No. Or just the joy of being able to hear the, the, the bustle and, the, and the, the movement that is taking place. We should be celebrating that. And I think when I think about God's heart, I think rather than him looking down on us, saying, man, I wish that guy just shut up for a little bit. <laughs> I, I think it's completely opposite. I believe that our Heavenly Father loves to hear the chatter. He loves to hear the conversation. He wants to invite us into these times to be praying at all times, and so I pray that it might be so, that it might be said of us, just like it was of Cornelius, that we are men and women of prayer, constant in prayer. But then you'll notice that it says, uh, pray at all times in the Spirit, and and again, this uh, there's lots of uh, debate over what that specifically means. I can go into that deeper uh, if time allowed. But for, for now, just know that that is, that is a true heart, a right spirit, and one without hypocrisy. One where we are guided by the true counselor that Jesus promised us, that God has given us to dwell within us. Uh, Romans uh, has some, some words to talk about that, that thing. Even when we don't know what to say, the spirit intercedes on our behalf. And he helps us uh, even to, to communicate the things that we're not even sure what we're supposed to be communicating to our God. And so pray at all times in the Spirit. And then it says, with all prayers and supplications. So we've had the frequency of prayer all the time. And next is the type of prayers. Prayers and supplications. Uh, John MacArthur stated once about this verse that the prayers and supplications represents all types of or all kinds of prayers. Uh, Specifically, this all types of prayers means just this all types of communication. It represents the spoken word. It it represents when we're singing uh, songs like the psalmist did. They would put their words down to music and they would spend time in prayer through music. Uh, They would spend time praying prayers of praise. They would say prayers of thanks. They would they would worship in their prayers. They would use God's own words to pray uh, just a few things back to him. But then also this word supplication. Uh, what type of prayer? Well, that's represented by a request. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, pray at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. Supplication there is the noun form uh, of the intended label for the action. So supplication is just the title or the container for the action that we are accomplishing. Which So it literally means the act of requesting, begging, asking, petitioning, imploring, entreating ourselves as we speak to the Lord our God. And we find this word again used as Paul speaks in the Philippians in chapter 4 verse 6. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication. That's where that word is found again. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And so, again, parents, you'll probably understand this fairly well, the types of things that your kids speak of, and maybe even the frequency of the things that they sometimes inquire of and request. And there's all types of things that they say. They, they'll tell you about things. They'll communicate what's going on, whether their heart is broken or whether their heart is happy or, or the things that they want. I mean, if you remember uh, the Sears catalog or the J.C. Penelog catalog, right? Uh, all different types of requests and items, we would, we would do it in different forms, right? We would just come out, Mom, Dad, this is what I want for Christmas, right? Or you just leave it on the table with a little note opened up, circled with a written, all types. And, and then there might even be the communication, Mom, Dad, you're such good parents. <laughs> And then, and then you know, all right, what do you want? You know, but there, I think there's some truth to this. There's all types of ways in which we ask questions, in which we communicate. And I think there's that same type. God wired that amongst us all uh, with his creation. I think he expects us to communicate with him in all different types and ways. So with all different types of prayers. And then he continues. Uh, all, the, all times in the spirit, all types of prayers, prayers and supplications, but then also with all perseverance all perseverance 
uh, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, Paul says. Perseverance. Now, there's a lot of pictures that come to mind when I think of perseverance. Um, this word, when you look it up, it represents the concept of energy, self-discipline, intensity, steadfastness. It means to keep on or persist on. I mean, this is, this is the picture. Now, for some of you who are a little bit older in the room, you'll probably uh, recognize this phrase. Those of you I've found who are a little bit younger, maybe you're not. But I'm going to give you a chance to all raise your hand uh, in this next uh, couple questions. It's three questions. Okay, so if you've heard this phrase before, go ahead and raise your hand. Keep your nose to the grindstone. Come on, you got to raise your hand. I just told it to you this week. <laughs> yeah, okay. Now, how many of you have never heard that phrase, keep your nose to the grindstone? Now, how many of you in the room just didn't want to raise your hand? <laughs> and if you didn't raise your hand, well, you do not get a participation ribbon. So, I mean... This idea, what does that mean? Keep your nose to the grindstone. I mean, it's this, it's this concept of, of just shoulder to the wheel, right? Yeah, there you go. So shoulder to the wheel, nose to the grindstone. You're just keep on keeping on, and you're just continuing to work. There's, there's difficult. Your muscles ache. There's, there's something happening that you're pushing against, but you're just going to keep on, keep on, Right? This is a good picture, I believe, of perseverance. And Paul calls us to persevere in our times of prayer. So this week, I just want to encourage you, put your nose to the grindstone when it comes to your times of prayer. Uh, just lean into it. Be persistent in prayer. Oftentimes, uh, we find ourselves... When do we find ourselves most persistent in prayer? I mean, when we're in trouble, right? Right? I mean, when, when we're in trouble, when we're, it feels like the, the sky is falling and the world is caving in and everything around us is just hard, that's when we tend to like bump up this elevation of, of prayer in our lives, where we become a little more perseverant, uh, if that's a word, in our, um, in our times of prayer because we, we want help. We, we acknowledge that we are out of control that we don't have the answers to this and we want uh, we want to persevere in asking the one that we believe has some input into this but this should not be the only time that we persevere in prayer uh, so i just want to encourage you no matter what's happening continue to persevere in prayer because for us being battle ready uh, this imagery of persevering in prayer is a key it's a key. And when I think through uh, being battle ready and, and looking at what it means to persevere in prayer, one of the pictures that, uh, I, that came to my mind was just this imagery of a flag. And, and I think through, uh, we've heard lots of debate about the Star Spangled Banner and what they were doing, but what was happening was that flag was standing for a reason. People were persevering in the middle of the fight. And as, uh, as they watched the landscape, they knew that the flag was still there and people were still in the battle and the battle was not uh, being overcome. There was a perseverance that was there. Now, that happens in a physical battle for a piece of land or rights. How much more should we be looking and persevering in a battle for the heavenly realms, for the salvation of those who are far from God, to, that they might come near to God, that we might be able to persevere because it's through the power of prayer that we call upon our God to enter into this battle with us. That being battle ready means that we are prayer warriors in all perseverance, resisting our spiritual enemy. And so pray at all times. Uh, pray all types of prayers. Pray with all perseverance, but... Uh, one of the things that when we pray, we have a list. I wrote down a couple things this morning even on a list uh, of things that I need to be in prayer for. And some of it, uh, one of it specifically was for someone. And that's great. What does Paul give us as an illustration for uh, praying? He says to pray for all the saints and also for me. That words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. 
that I might be an ambassador in chains, that I might declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Now, as we break that down just a little bit, all the saints, oftentimes we think of paintings and old chapels and old churches, right? Or we see the, the picture in our Bible if you're scrolling through the Bible and you come to a picture, if your Bible has pictures, um, praise the Lord for pictures. But uh, sometimes when we think of a saint, we see that picture of one of the apostles or Jesus himself, and, and it's got this little, this round halo around, and, and we name that a saint. Uh, there's different churches that ha- have specifically set up saints, and, and that's often what we think of. But the saints here represent those who have surrendered their lives to Christ and are living to make him known. A saints are you and me as we live out our life for Christ. Saints are those who have come before us, who have lived out their life for Christ, entering into the battle, sacrificing so that others might know the hope of the gospel. That's who the saints are. And now what are we supposed to be praying uh, for as we remember the saints, as we pray for the saints, one another, that we might be able to speak boldly. Now, I'm not saying this as, a, as an idea to, to ridicule, but oftentimes when we pray, for one another, the saints. It's about the ailments that we have. And that's not bad. It's not bad. But when it occupies the majority of why we're praying for one another, that's where we see life out of balance. And as we look at the scriptures, what Paul prays for is not that he would have the thorn removed from his flesh, not that he would be taken out of the physical ailment that he's having, not that he would be uh, specifically rescued from his chains, but that he would be able to speak boldly and proclaim boldly the gospel. So as you pray for one another uh, this week, I I pray that, yes, lift one another up in whatever is ailing you, but... Very quickly, if not before that, pray that they might, in those situations, wherever they might f- find themselves, no matter what setting uh, the church finds themselves in, that we would be able to boldly proclaim the gospel, that we would be able to proclaim the hope, pray for one another. Because sometimes when uh, we're out in the world, when we're at our workplace, when we're in our schools, it seems a little overwhelming to think that we can actually speak into the battle that we see around us. But there's a great illustration that scriptures give us. It's not just an illustration, it's an actual account. Forgive me. (laughs) It's an actual account that comes. It's in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6. And it's... The account is found in uh, verses 8 through 23. But we see in this setting, uh, the king of Syria, the kingdom of Syria is raging against Israel. I mean, they're warring against Israel in a physical battle. This is happening. And the king of Assyria is upset because everything that he tries to do, it's not working. (laughs) Like, if he'll move his troops one way, and, and it's... No enemy there. Israel's not there. They're, they're well defended. He, and he says it's not working. He asks this question, why? And so uh, one, of the, one of his servants says it's because uh, Elisha uh, knows what you're saying even, even in your bedroom because the Spirit is revealing it to him. The God is revealing it to him. And he's able to, to help them avoid and um, overcome the battle. And so the king of Assyria sets out to find Elijah, and they do. And they surround the city that they're in, and Elisha's servants, uh, a servant, they get up and they look out and they see that the, the whole army of Syria has surrounded them. And as you would, as you looked out across the landscape and you saw a whole army surrounding you, Uh, you would get get a little nervous. And so he tells Elijah about his anxiousness. And he says, um, don't be worried. And and he says this in in chapter 6, verse 16 of 2 Kings. He says, do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. And so the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And what happens in this setting is that Elisha then prays again, and and he prays that they'd be struck blind. And so they're all blind. The enemy's all blind, and he goes out, and he meets them, and he says, oh, you're looking for the man of God. I'll lead you to him. 
And so he leads them to uh, the, the city there in, um, I forget the name of the city. Uh, it's in the account there. Uh, and he, Samaria, yes. He leads them to the city in, in Samaria, and, and the king of Israel is like seeing this all unfolding, and Elisha, uh, he says, well, what should I do? And uh, should, I, should I kill them all? Should I strike them all, all dead? But Elisha prays that the enemy would have their eyes opened again, and so they have their eyes open. The king says, should I strike them all down? And Elisha says, no. And um, he says to feed them. And so he feeds them, he sends them back home, and because of this act, there was peace. There was no more battle. There was no more attacks that Syria would make on, on Israel. And it happened because, well, one man prayed. And um, there was a kindness shown. And there was the acknowledgement that, well, we as human beings are weak. And when we feel alone... We need to only remember the, the promises that God has given us, that he is with us. Just as he promised Joshua, God is with us. I will be with you wherever you go. Uh, he is with us. And just as I started the whole series, he who is with us is greater than he who is in the world. This is, this is the truth that in the midst of the battle, we can enter the battle not alone, but with the power of God. And yes, he's given us all these things as tools to help us be wise, not unwise. Uh, things to help protect us from, from physical harm, but also mainly the things that would, would lead us to spiritual detriment. And he wraps this whole letter up, really, with this call to prayer. He calls the church to prayer. So pray at all times. Uh, pray all types of prayer. Um, Pray uh, that uh, we would be perseverant in prayer. Persevere in prayer and, and pray for the saints for the purpose of being able to speak the words boldly. Because that's how we enter into the battle. And remember that we don't do it alone. We don't do it alone. So this week in your uh, extra take-home sheet, there's some questions there. There's a little summary thing you can read through on the back there, there's just a, a simple prayer that I, I wrote. If you want to pray that prayer, you can. If not, don't worry about it. Pray your own prayer. But just each day, there's something there for you to pray and add to it. Um, I wanted to make it fairly simple. But just, just spend some time in prayer and pray for one another that we might be able to speak boldly into the situations that God places us into, hope and life. Uh, if you're looking for uh, tangible areas outside of our Jerusalem, uh, you can pray for our missionaries. There's a, a list on our website. They're all over the globe. Some are a little bit closer to home, and some are to the far reaches. Pray that they would be able to speak boldly the gospel, that in the, in the battles that they're facing, they would be able to stand firm, that they would be able to uh, ward off the enemy's attacks, and they would be able to uh, proclaim this hope that gives life. Spend some time in prayer this week. And, and if there's a, uh, something specific, maybe there's a, a decision that you want to make to really you know, seek out this God in heaven who is, who is with us, and, and, and maybe you've never declared that he is your Lord and your Savior and, and confessed him as Lord or joined in the waters of baptism, becoming that new life, uh, receiving the Holy Spirit, uh, come. Let's, let's talk about the scriptures. Let's, let's, uh, let's enter into that process as we respond to God. And, and yet maybe there's a situation where you just need prayer. Uh, there's a situation happening. Maybe there's a person that comes to mind that you want to be in prayer for. Uh, let's do that together. Um, you, can, you can do that as we dismiss just down front here. So I'm going to invite you to stand. Uh, may this week you just be perseverant in prayer. I want to close in prayer. Lord God, seated high in the heavens and ruler of all, creator of all, uh, all-knowing, ever-present, God, we come to you 
knowing you hear our prayers. Lord, forgive us when we fall down and when we exchange the, uh, the fruit and the glory of heaven for the temporary of the present. God, thank you for these words that Paul has spoken to challenge us and encourage us and call us to action. Lord God, as, as your church, I pray that you would um, do a work in us and through us, that you would reveal to us areas where Satan is gaining footholds and where he is taking grounds. And I pray that you would uh, give us the practical steps to be able to stand against his schemes and that together as a church we would uh, find strength, uh, not, not just from one another, but ultimately from you and your word, words of truth. God, thank you that uh, you are a father in heaven who loves to hear and invites us into conversation at all times. And that you have wired us all differently so that as we respond to you, uh, we have this beautiful chorus of, of, uh, that is being lifted, whether it be in song or silent word or a, an actual out loud spoken word, whether it be in a time of praise or a time of lament or a time of anguish. Uh, God, you, you hear it all and you, you desire to hear it all. And that you answer all. Uh, Lord, as a church, we pray for one another that we would be strengthened. And we pray for our missionaries across the seas and, and uh, those who are even a little bit closer to home. Uh, God, that you would just continue to help them speak and proclaim boldly uh, the hope that is found in the truth of your word. And that you'd help us and equip us to do that same thing. That we would trust fully in you. That when we need the words to speak, that you will, you will give us those words. And when you uh, call us into action, you will give us the strength and the resources to act. Help us to be the body of Christ that you've called us to be. God, and may you be glorified. May you be glorified. Lead us this day to accomplish your will. And join us together again as we gather. These things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Have a great week, church.